Hello everyone, my name is Dr Sarah Halliday and I would first like to say a huge welcome and thank you to you all for joining us today. It is my privilege to launch the University of Dundee's Climate Change Seminar Series, which will see a number of events take place throughout October in the lead up to the COP26 United Nations Climate Change Conference. The scheduling of COP26 to take place in Glasgow this year means that leaders from around the world will come to Scotland to participate in what we hope will be the most significant discussions about the future of our planet since the signing of the Paris Climate Accord in 2015. The hosting of the meeting in Glasgow also provides the UK and Scottish governments with a unique opportunity to be the driving force behind bringing meaningful global progress on this critical issue. However, it also provides us with a unique opportunity to raise awareness about the crisis within the wider population and the actions needed by all citizens to tackle the climate change that lies ahead. Over the last 50 years, concerns about climate change have been increasing. The amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere has increased along with human emissions since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere has increased along with human emissions since the start of the Industrial Revolution. The atmospheric carbon dioxide is now higher than at any point in the last two million years. This is critical as carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. This means that it absorbs and radiates heat. Without this natural effect, the average Earth temperature would be below freezing. However, the human induced increases in climate and greenhouse gases have tipped our energy's budget out of balance, trapping additional heat and leading to rising temperatures. 2020 tied with 2016 as the warmest year on record. In 2020, we were one degree higher than the 1951 to 1980 average. This is continuing a long-term trend in our planet's warming that have seen the last seven years be the hottest on record. As a result of these changes, the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report published in August has concluded that climate change is now rapid, widespread and intensifying. We have seen the accelerating impacts of climate change in different forms across the world, from global sea level rise threatening our coastal communities to increases in extreme weather events causing catastrophic damage. This summer in China's Henan province, a year's worth of rainfall fell in just three days, leading to fatalities and the displacement of over 1 million people. It also saw the destruction of over 2 million acres of cropland. Just this week, over three years worth of rainfall has fallen in Oman due to Cyclone Shehi. Meanwhile, in Argentina, an ongoing drought has seen the Parana River, a key transport route for the country's crop and soya, has now reached its lowest level in 77 years. This is raising concerns about the supply and quality of drinking water for the people that depend on this river system. In addition, it's also raising concerns about navigation and port operation and the wider ecosystem, and also on the generation of hydroelectric power on which the local communities are dependent. Between summer 2019 and March 2020, I'm sure you all be aware of the unprecedented bushfires that took place in Australia. More than 46 million acres burned. That's roughly the same area as the country of Syria, as well as the loss of life, homes and businesses. The ecological and biodiversity impacts of the fires were immense. More than a third of the koala population, an already endangered species, 
died as a direct result of the fires. In addition, the ash that was produced by the fires had significant impacts on the local water quality. The fires themselves also estimated to produce 715 million tonnes of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere, exacerbating the problems we are already experiencing. But we are also seeing these effects much closer to home. In 2020, unprecedented rainfall in August, the equivalent of a month's rain in just a day, led to extensive flash flooding with the Union Canal bursting its blanks. And just this July, over half a month's rainfall fell in an hour, leading to significant flash flooding in Edinburgh. This was despite the summer of 2021 being the fourth hottest summer since records began, with reservoir levels dropping to their lowest in 18 years. Together with the very low river levels, this means that a significant proportion of Scotland is already experiencing moderate water scarcity right now. And during the course of this summer, some private water supply users had to receive bottled water from Scottish water because the supplies that they normally depend on had either run dry or become undrinkable due to quality issues. Through these events, the interaction between society and our water, food and energy systems is apparent. No change occurs in isolation or without impact. The water, food and energy sectors are critical to a functioning society and they are all impacted by and critical for addressing climate change. Over the course of the next four weeks, you will hear from a range of speakers, all linked to the University of Dundee, who have different expertise and perspectives related to the climate crisis that we now face. Through these sessions, we will not only explore the impacts that we can expect as a result of climate change within this water energy food nexus, but we will also look at the creative responses we can take to these challenges. Considering how we can both adapt and mitigate, as well as tackle and address the challenges that lie ahead. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Carolyn Clayson, Dr. Nanda Mukherjee and Dr. Andrew Black, where we'll be exploring ideas around the importance of glaciers for water resources and the impact that their climate driven retreat could have. We'll also be looking at how natural flood uh, management could help us mitigate the flood risks that we face. And we'll be looking at the amazing United Nations award winning work of building sustainable photo floating homes in Bangladesh's flood plain areas. Next week, we'll move on to looking at our food systems and how they will be impacted by climate change. Professor Derek Stewart, Dr Beverly Searle and Professor Jenny McDermott will join us to talk about novel production systems that will help secure Scotland's ongoing food security. We will also look at how understanding factors around nutrition and the international impacts of our current food systems can help us make change. And we'll also look at the societal shifts that will take place as a result of changes in our food system and the importance of mental health and well-being within those changes. In week three, we'll move on to look at the energy sector. Our dependence on fossil fuels is one of the principal drivers for global warming. Yet as a society and global economy, we're still heavily dependent on these sources of energy. This has led to an increasing number of businesses and nations around the world committing to net zero carbon commitments in recent years. Tangy Jones, Professor Sue Dawson and Dr Tong Zhu will look at different aspects of how we can transition to renewable energy sources, looking at decarbonisation of the heating sector, through to issues of climate injustice and energy provision, and also looking at the risks posed to our energy infrastructure through a changing climate. In our final session, we will look at creative responses to climate change, exploring how approaches that utilise visual arts can enhance people's understanding of climate change, 
enriching dialogues, deepening connections and critically motivating action. Our speakers, Kieran Baxter, Angus Farquhar, Professor Tina Kovats and Dr. Suzanne Alweer will share with us their fascinating work on aspects such as filming Glacier Retreat, setting up Dandelion, one of Scotland's largest Grow Your Own initiatives, from the creation of the Relay for Nature Baton, which has been carried to COP26 by boat, and then also looking at the concept of the 20 minute neighbourhood, the idea where people will meet their daily needs within 20 minutes of their home. We'll conclude our final session with a panel discussion with all of the chairs from these four sessions joining, as well as Dundee High School student Lavinia Ismail, whose recent opinion piece in The Courier explained why climate change isn't a threat to our futures, it's something that is happening now and upon which we must all act. We very much hope you will be able to join us for all of these sessions, or at least some of them, and that they're a source of inspiration to not only think about the personal changes we can all make in our life to be live more sustainably and environmentally aware, but also where we can see our voice in influencing and driving political change. I would like now to pass to Professor John Rowan, the Vice Principal for Research, Knowledge Exchange and Wider Impact here at the University of Dundee to say a few words about the critical role of climate research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it's an absolute pleasure, uh, colleagues, to be able to say, uh, to be invited to offer some introductory remarks. So I'm obviously not going to repeat Sarah's excellent in introduction, simply to say this is a remarkable time of climate consciousness. And I think we have the priv privilege of the world's eyes being trained on Scotland and in Glasgow for COP26. So, so there's really no pressure on us at all. Today is the first of a programme of events working in partnership with the City of Dundee um, through our public engagement mission in terms of the Festival of the Future. And it's a great chance for us to contribute our insights, experiences and commitment to addressing the, the climate emergency as an academic community with, with our feet planted locally, but with a very internationalist worldview. So I think as Sarah said, reducing emissions is vital to avoiding further climate change for the dangerous climate change. But we also face major adaptation challenges dealing with the changes in the climate system that are already manifest and set to get worse before things get better. In part, I was going to draw upon uh, Sarah's wonderful set of examples from around the world that as we, we consider um, climate change that's affecting Scotland. Sarah has just recently been in the media looking at the issue of, of drought, which is becoming increasingly an issue within otherwise a very water rich Scotland. The, the concerns that are expressed around drought within Scotland with respect to the whiskey industry is that it contributes something in the order of four billion pounds per year for our export economy. And anything that jeopardises that has major implications for the Scottish economy. But I think as Sarah very elegantly explained, whilst we may have concerns about lifestyle or ec economic impact, then climate change is a very presenting uh, risk to livelihoods and lives around the world in quite particular ways, whether it be the, the heat dome in Canada, whether it be the drought in Paraguay, whether it be the forest fires in California. These are all now major events which are having not only um, economic impacts, but directly threaten and indirectly threaten livelihoods from the impact of dis disastrous uh, climate impacts. So I think today is a wonderful opportunity to showcase uh, some of the talent that we have within the University of Dundee. It's really gratifying to see that we've got a lineup that comprises postdoc and academic established stars within the university now and we welcome back Dr. Caroline Clayson, who was a, an undergraduate of the University of Dundee, a superstar in her own day, and now wonderful to see her thriving as an associate professor at, at, at Plymouth. And then we're going to hear from our colleagues and, and, and the, 
the contribution that we can make um, as an academic community in the university. And I just wanted to say that that's really important for us as a university because we're at the beginning of our um, strategic plan. We're developing a new strategy for the university. It emphasises the importance of academic excellence around both our, the quality of the research that we undertake, the educational programmes that we develop, and the partnerships and, and the way in which we can impact the world through the translation of our research into, into public good, be it locally um, or globally. And so being part of a, a, a conversation like this uh, is incredibly important for the university. And as we develop that new strategy moving forward, then uh, we're very conscious of the need to be more overtly at driving climate and climate action, climate safe policies within the university and climate action that will help us minimise our environmental impact on the planet. And to that end, the university has also just recently established a climate action planning group. Um, some of you may know that we were absolutely delighted um, in this year, 2021, to receive um, a recognition from the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings that the University of Dundee was placed first in the UK and fifth in the world with respect to climate action in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals. And whilst that's an absolutely incredible um, accolade to receive, I think there's no prospect that we can be complacent or we can sit on our pedestal and think we've done a jolly good job. Because whilst the analysis that goes into producing these rankings shows that we've got world class research, world class teaching, we're strongly committed to disaster reduction and, and, and community resilience around the world. We've got progressive policies within the university. You're only as good as, as your, the, the piece of work that you've done in the recent past. And therefore, we're very, very committed to moving forward with a, a, a climate action plan that will help us meet and indeed exceed the Scottish Government's targets for net zero carbon before we hope very much as we develop those plans more concretely before 2045. So that's as much as I wanted to say. Uh, forgive me for losing my, my, my screen feed. Um, I hope that that was reasonably coherent. I know that we've got a very exciting programme and I know that there's lots of questions already coming in on the chat. And so I would just like to close there by saying thank you to Sarah and her team for organising these events. There's a number of delegates that will go from the University of Dundee out to Glasgow to COP. We've got a very nice delegation made up of men and women, senior and junior colleagues, and from a range of disciplines who will be effectively a, a, a delegation throughout the two weeks of COP in Glasgow. And whatever we get from those interactions, we'll bring back into this community um, and discuss that further after the fact. So without further ado, thank you for attending. Thank you to the presenters for their contributions. And I'll hand you over now to uh, Andrew Allen, who's going to um, be the Master of Ceremonies today. Thank you. Thanks, John. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrew Allen. I'm a lecturer in law here at the University of Dundee. Um, and I'm also the director of the UNESCO Centre for Water Law Policy and Science here. Uh, my interests are directly in fresh water. So and climate change, this is a very uh, interesting um, session for me. Uh, I'm delighted that we've got three such eminent speakers today. Um, I'm just going to introduce them very briefly um, because you'll get much more of a sense of them when they present. Um, we've got three presenters, as I say. Um, first up, we've got um, Professor Caroline Clayson. John's already mentioned the fact that she is a, a professor, a associate professor at the University of Plymouth, but is also a, a graduate from 2008, I think, Caroline, um, from the where she got a first in her BSc Ons at University of Dundee, which is excellent. Uh, she is a specialist in glaciology and glacial hydrology um, and uh, describes herself as a, an equality and diversity advocate for um, more inclusion in STEM subjects in particular. Uh, she's also the leader of the centre, I'm going to read this, um, the Centre for Research and Environment and Society at the University of Plymouth, which is a cross-disciplinary um, grouping which goes across um, human and physical geography um, areas. Secondly, um, we have a talk from Dr. Nandan Mukherjee. Nandan is a, 
a postdoc at the UNESCO Center for Water Law so Policy and Science with me. Um, and he's recently finished his PhD focusing in particular on loss and damage aspects uh, in relation to water resources, particularly in um, Bangladesh. However, he has a, um, a lot of hinterland and previously he was an assistant professor um, at the university or the Brack University in Dhaka um, in the group, uh, the Centre for Climate Change and Environmental Research. Um, so he brings a lot of experience, partly from the COP and partly from the, the one of the most vulnerable countries on, on Earth. Uh, and finally, and certainly not least, um, third, we have Dr. Andrew Black, who is a reader um, in Geography and Environmental Science at the University of Dundee. Um, Andrew has a huge amount of experience, 30 years of experience, um, focusing principally on hydrology. Um, he, his main areas of focus are on uh, water resources management and on flood risk. Uh, and a lot of the work he's been doing especially has been on um, Scottish rivers, most particularly, I think, the Edelston in the borders and the Feshi in the up towards Cairngorm. Um, I think that's all I need to say about all three of them at the moment. Um, so uh, as, as, as has been said already, if you have questions, please put them in the, the Q&A chat and we'll endeavour to answer as many of them as we can. Um, we will have a, set, a question and answer session where we can deal with all these questions at the end of each presentation, currently scheduled for five minutes for each. And we'll see how the timing goes. Um, I'm for those for the presenters. I'm going to try to be as tight as I can on your timing. If you can stick to the 15 minutes, that would be great. Um, and now I'd like to hand over directly to Professor Caroline Clayson from Plymouth University. Thank you, Caroline. So thanks very much for the, the really nice introduction, Andrew. I got a little uh, promotion there. I'm still a doctor, but yeah, <laughs> but it's really nice to be back virtually um, at the University of Dundee, um, where I did study geography and I think particularly my experience with both glaciology and hydrology have really shaped um, what I do today. So it's very nice to be back. So I'm going to be talking today um, briefly about the impact of glacier change on water security with a focus on the Peruvian Andes. OK, so I lead a project called Sigma Peru. Um, I've been working on this for the last few years, and this is a UK Peru collaboration that looks at um, the downstream consequences of uh, glacier and land use change in a basin called uh, the Rio Santa Basin, which is a very large uh, river basin in the Peruvian tropical Andes. Um, related to this project, I also work on two sort of sister projects. Um, the first is uh, called Glacier Map, and that's a, a project where we use an online mapping tool to ask the public and particularly school students were interested in, in their input uh, in this and getting people involved at a young age. And we asked them to help us map change of glaciers in the Cordillera Blanca in the, the Rio Santa region of Peru. Um, and that actually helps them to develop some spatial literacy, connective thinking and all sorts of other things that are really useful um, for learning um, as young age geographers. And uh, one of my close colleagues, Sally Rangecroft, also leads on a project called uh, Nuestro Rio, which means Our River, which is a photo submission app that can be used on a smartphone, but also can be used in the field on something like an iPad, where we ask local people in the Rio Santa to submit pictures um, and include their perceptions and emotions related to the water quality shown in those pictures to help build up a spatial picture of how people feel about water quality in, in the basin. So today, I'm going to be giving a fairly general overview of the issues of um, water, water resources and glaciers in, in the Peruvian Andes, but this is very much the output of the Sigma project. So a bit about water security to start with, since really this is what this uh, seminar series is, is all about. Um, essentially, we can define this as access to safe drinking water and sanitation, which is a really core component of the sustainable development goals. Um, so it's really crucial for, for us and, um, as, and life on Earth, really. Um, but we know that there are increased pressures on this. A lot of that is to do with climate change, which is obviously the, the focus of the COP discussions. But this is really compounded by also changes to population, increases in population in many regions and economic growth that goes along with that. 
I would argue, and I think many people would argue, that water is one of the most exploited um, of natural resources. But perhaps you don't know already that about 70% of extraction of water is directly used for agriculture. And that's made even worse by the fact that in many places there's poor um, land use practices for that agriculture. So the issue of land degradation um, makes it more unsustainable. So it really compounds the issue of water availability for that crop produc production in the first place. And add into that energy consumption with about 30% of that being used just to produce and supply food. Um, we can really start to see how these three sectors, food, energy, uh, food, energy and water security are all inextricably linked. So how much do glaciers contribute then? Um, all of the ice on Earth and our glaciers and ice caps and ice sheets covers about 10% of the Earth's surface. However, within those, um, we contain about 70% of total global fresh water. That's a huge amount when you think about it. So actually, it's an incredibly important store of that fresh water. I'm interested particularly in the Andes, but this is also um, a really big issue for, for parts of high mountain Asia, so the Himalayas, for example, the Hindu Kush, um, where literally hundreds of millions of people rely directly on that meltwater being produced by glacier melt um, to to meet their water resource needs downstream. What I don't have time to talk about today is the quality of those glacier fed waters, but that's a really um, something that's um, very important to me as a researcher, so also a crucial component of water security. However, having said all that, this quite complicated image probably, it's from a lovely new paper, but essentially all of these uh, ready orange bars that you can see across this map the fact that they're all red and orange tells us that glaciers in all of these regions around the world are thinning. So they're losing mass by becoming thinner as they um, melt in response to climate with a, a total of um, 266 gigatons per year of ice loss. Um, and we can see that uh, the Southern Andes, the tropical Andes are, are part of that um, and all around the world. So there is a, a general trend of, of ice loss everywhere we look. Now, focusing in on the Andes, um, if you have a look at the, the right hand side of the slide to start with, we can see that precipitation in the Andes um, is very low. So let's see if I can turn on my laser pointer. Hopefully you can see that. I don't know if you can, but um, the you can see where it says Peru on the map. And to the left of that, um, we can see that average rainfall is very low in this region, somewhere between 500 and 1000 millimetres per year. But to make that even worse, it's also very seasonal. So we have a really distinct dry season and wet season in uh, Peru. Um, actually about 70, 60 to 70 percent of total annual rainfall falls within uh, the wettest three months of the year. So that really compounds the issue um, of the fact that it's a dry environment to start with. Not only that, but across much of South America, um, people actually rely on, on glacial meltwater for even up to 80 to 100 percent of their needs. Um, so in Peru, hopefully you can see this image on my screen. It looks like it's showing a different uh, a different slide. So hopefully you can see the right one. Um, each of the eyes on the slide here next to Peru represents a thousand people and where that eye is black, it's, it shows that those thousand people um, rely on glacial meltwater for 45 to 80% of their meltwater needs. Um, and where the eye is red, they rely on it for 80 to 100% of their water needs. And that's about 360,000 people. So with half of them relying on glacial meltwater for basically all of their water needs. So it's a really uh, large proportion of people. <clears throat> so a little bit about the catchment that I'm working in. Um, it's called uh, the Rio Santa. It's a very large catchment in, in Peru. Um, it's on Peru's um, west coast um, and on the, the eastern side of the, the Cordillera Blanca mountain range that feeds uh, the Rio Santa catchment is uh, essentially um, the Amazon rainforest or the, up, the upper headwaters of, of the Amazon. Um, so it's a really important mountain range from that perspective too. Um, in the upper basin, it's very much an alpine tundra or moderate climate, uh, while lower down towards the coast, we're looking at something that's much more desert like or subtropical. So uh, quite a range in climatic conditions. And the main economic activities in this region include lots of agriculture, a lot of which comes over to places like the UK for things like asparagus and potatoes and corn, um, but also things like mining and tourism that can contribute um, to the environmental issues in the basin. 
So, a little bit about meltwater contribution in Peru. In the Andes, about 10 million people rely directly on meltwater for their domestic water supply and also for food production. And I've put a couple of pictures highlighting some of that food production on the right. Um, glacial meltwater provides about 10 to 20 percent of that uh, discharge annually in the Rio Santa Basin. However, during the dry season, which, as I said before, is really crucial in this part of the, the world, um, over 40 percent of that discharge can be accounted for um, by glacial meltwater. And during periods of drought, which occur in this region due to things like the El Nino phenomena, for example, um, meltwater can actually attribute up to 90 percent. So it's a really, really important uh, source. Peru does an excellent job when it comes to green energy and about 50% of its electricity comes from hydropower. So that glacial meltwater isn't just important for domestic water supply, but also for that energy production in Peru. And what about the mountain range that feeds that? The glaciers and the Cordillera Blanca are part of the, the most uh, heavily glaciated tropical mountain range on Earth. However, to put that into context, there's not a lot of glacier cover there. And even in the last 40 years, that glacier cover has decreased by about 35%. Good water energy security nexus. And I've drawn up uh, what this nexus looks like for the Rio Santa Basin. And I've put livelihoods right in the middle of that because for me, that's also a really crucial component of this nexus. Um, and I've, I've put uh, some of the things to think about um, in the nexus in the context of the Rio Santa. But there's also a lot of pressures on that nexus. And in, in the in Peru, things like, of course, climate change as we're talking about today and glacier retreat, but also both natural and anthropogenic contamination. There's lots of erosion um, in this part of the world with associated sedimentation downstream. And in addition to that, this is quite a hazard active part of the world too. We have floods and drought, but we also have seismic activity that can um, lead to, to quite a lot of landslide activity, for example. And that's not to even think about the social pressures on top of that. This is a highly unstable part of the world in terms of uh, geopolitics. Um, land use change isn't always as uh, sustainable as it could be. And there are concerns about corruption that mean um, in influencing policy can be really quite tricky. So next slide, please, John. OK, so. One of the concepts that in our work we think about um, is something called peak water. So if you if you can click again, John. If we think about air temperature increases, which we know are happening now and next, John. Thanks. Um, that leads to an associated um, decrease in glacier area cover. And next, John. And along with that associated decrease, what we initially see is an increase in river discharge. So there's more ice being melted, so that means that there's more meltwater being generated downstream and higher discharge in the rivers. Um, what happens though, unfortunately, is once the glaciers reach a certain size, there just simply isn't enough ice area left to generate the same amount of meltwater. So what we get is a point in time called peak water, and after that point in time we see a drop off in the discharge downstream. And in places like the Andes, um, we actually expect that that's could potentially have already happened. So we're already in a situation where we have a, a general decline in water availability. Next slide, please, John. So the, this is a result of a modelling study, but it shows how peak water is happening across the world. Um, next, please. So in South America, uh, both, both from observations, but also um, in terms of modelling, we think peak water is probably already passed, which means we're already on that falling limb of that uh, discharge hydrograph. And next, John. In the European Alps, closest to home, if you like, we think um, that peak water is probably around about now. And next, please. And in the Himalayas, which is one of the largest areas in terms of population reliant on glacial meltwater from high mountain Asia, um, we think peak water is still to come in many basins. So actually some of the lessons that we can learn from South America can be passed on when we think about how best to manage the situation in other parts of the world. And next slide, please. 
So this uh, slide here, if you look along uh, the X axis at the bottom, we've got a timeline that goes from 1950 to 2050 into the future. And each of the circles and triangles you see on there are the results of different studies that have tried to estimate when peak water has happened in the Rio Santa catchment of Peru. And what you'll immediately see is there's quite a range of um, estimations um, from the mid 70s all the way up to, to 2040 for one particular sub basin there. So what we know is there's a lot of uncertainty around when peak water happens, but even more uncertainty around how we're actually calculating that in the first place. What you, else you can see on this image is that's compounded by a growing population, both in Juarez and Chimbose, which are two of the biggest cities in this region. We've seen steady population growth um, from the 1950s. And also, um, this is a region that's warming. So what you can see in the background of this slide are different uh, climate model scenarios. And where it's blue, it means it's slightly cooler than the average. And where it's red, particularly dark red, means we're seeing temperatures are warmer than, than the average. So this is a, a basin under pressure. Next slide, please. So to help improve how people can manage uh, water catchments and manage those water resources, um, one thing that we would like to propose is how we use terminology differently. So we might consider using the term glacial peak water if we've measured that discharge very close to the, the front of the glacier, because we know that largely that is capturing just glacial melt. Unfortunately, in a lot of studies currently, there isn't a definition between where that peak water has been um, calculated. So actually, if it's been measured much further downstream, we might see larger proportions from precipitation, from catchment storage, from things like reservoirs and groundwater and wetlands, for example. So we think it's really important that we communicate uh, to policymakers and water managers um, where and how we are actually estimating these things. And, and terminology is a really crucial part of doing that. Next slide, please. Can I just say you've got one more minute, I'm afraid, Caroline. OK, no worries. Thank you. What about water quality? Well, again, I said at the start, I don't really have the time to talk about that today, but I just wanted to highlight a few types of water quality issues in glacial catchments, everything from um, acid drainage from natural um, iron and rocks, but also from mining activities. We have things like human waste and rubbish disposal. Um, a lot of these, especially upper catchment communities, don't have um, wastewater treatment systems. So there's a a bit of a, a mismatch in quality between the upstream of these catchments and the downstream. So something else that's really important for us to think about. And next slide, please, final one. So what's next? Um, projected temperature change in this region, worst case scenario, we're looking at three to five degrees um, by the late 21st century, um, sort of um, based on different uh, climate scenarios. If we try and keep it to a healthy climate scenario, we're still seeing a, a two degree rise um, by the end of the century. Um, next, John. In terms of uh, water supply in the Rio Santa Basin, um, best case scenario would probably see about an 11% decrease in that supply, um, but worst case scenario about a 16%, which would only be worse during the dry season too. These are, these are annual average estimations. And the last point, John. And solutions, which I don't have time to talk about today, there's many of them, but we have our different adaptation and mitigation solutions, so things that can be done locally, locally to help people actually adapt to these changes, things that we can do globally in terms of how we how we're responsible in our consumption, the types of transport we use and energy sources we use and emissions in general. But one thing I would point out is that Peru has a limited capacity to actually adapt to this. Um, however, they're experiencing some of these effects of climate change really quite acutely in this region. So it's important um, that we can try and make a difference in, in parts of these world, particularly uh, by working alongside the people who, who live and work there. So I'll leave it there and thanks very much. Thank you very much, Caroline. That was excellent. Um, the lots and lots of issues there. And I've, I've been looking at the, the questions in the, the chat. I think we've addressed all the questions, so um, I am going to use chair's privilege to ask uh, some of my own, if that's OK. Uh, I'm looking at everybody else. Is that, is that OK? I think it is. Uh, quite alarming to see that peak water, you think that peak water has already been reached in Peru. Um, do you think that's the case for the whole of the Andean system? And if it is, 
um, what sense do you have of when that uh, runoff curve will come down to zero? Oh, um, in terms of it coming down to zero, um, I think hopefully it won't. I mean, in, in the place of where the glaciers are, you know, where we don't have snowfall anymore, we'll have precipitation. There are some um, stores in the catchments as well. So there are wetlands and some of those are being regenerated as well. So we can retain more water. Um, so I, I don't think it's uh, a disastrous <laughs> um, prediction. I hope it won't go down to that. Um, but I think for the Andes in general, based on modelling studies, um, it's likely that peak water has passed in that region. And yeah, we're on the wrong side of that trend now. So I think it's about adapting to that in that part of the world where in other parts of the world, we maybe still can think about, you know, whether we can mitigate um, the changes enough that they won't see uh, the impacts that unfortunately we are seeing in, in South America. Thanks. Yeah, I wondered about the seasonal aspects as well. Because if you've got the um, an increased that increased runoff, I think your that runoff is starting earlier, isn't it? And um, maybe at the end of the normal season, tailing off, has that had an impact on the kind of crops that we've been seeing from Peru coming into the shops here? You mentioned asparagus. And yeah, I, think, I don't I don't know if we've seen an impact of that on the shelves yet, but I know that um, in basins like this in Peru because of the changing climate in particular, and because of new irrigation um, measures, there's a big, a really big uh, scheme called the Chavimogic Irrigation Scheme that has caused a huge amount of land to be um, usable for cropland now. Um, so what they are seeing is um, an increase in the elevational um, possibility for crop growth. So where crops were pro probably only grown at lower elevations, Previously, now we're seeing an increase in where they can be uh, produced upstream, but that has no knock-on impacts too. It means the land is potentially less um, sustainable. Um, it, it mobilises sediment and causes issues for things like hydropower schemes downstream. So yeah, it's really um, strongly interlinked. Thank you. Sorry, that was a bit of an abuse me taking over questions there. Um, I think probably we should move on. Yes, and we have Nandan's slides there. I can see them. Nandan, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you okay. Uh, my thank question you. is, can you hear me well now? Yeah, thank you. I'll pass over to you now then, Nandan. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening from Bangladesh. Um, in this presentation, I'm uh, going to discuss about the utilization of the water energy food nexus on the design of a disaster resilient school in Bangladesh, which is inspired by the United Nations Risk Award 2019 winning flood resilient home. I have three messages today, which I'm going to share in different phases along the presentation. So uh, our achievements over the last millennia was not significant. Human population increased from 1 billion to nearly 8 billion now which is expected to rise 1.6 times by 2050. World GDP has increased by nearly 100 times. Energy sources have increased more than 30 times, which will further increase to 2.5 times more by 2050. Human mobility and access to transportation has increased more than 1,000 times. But the cost of trade-off includes the emission of greenhouse gases. In 1800, the carbon dioxide concentration was only 0.3 gigaton, which has increased 120 times to 36.4 gigaton last year. So if you look into the first graph in the left panel, due to this, the rise of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we are experiencing around, sorry, uh, if you just look into the lower uh, uh, third graph in the left, we are experiencing around $40 billion of economic loss over the last three decades. And the next curve, the last one, most notable was loss of 1.4 million human lives, mostly from developing countries. And more than 6 billion people were affected either in terms of damage of their personal health, assets, and properties. Next slide, please. Now, scientists are concerned about sixth extinction of population from this earth. The Nature article published in 2007, followed by article by Elizabeth in 2009, where 
anthropogenic contribution was blamed. And recently, a book published by Well et al. The different types of anthropogenic responses leading to irreversible loss and damage is noted. Uh, this publication last year said that climate change caused by burning fossil fuels and other human activities passes on ex existential threat to homo sapiens and contributes to, contributes to mass extinction of species. Next slide, please. So my first message from this presentation is what we have accomplished in terms of global development thus far appears incomparable to what we have suffered in terms of loss and damage. Next slide, please. So we all know that greenhouse gases are the root causes of climate change. This figure in the left, however, shows that we are missing something probably. Two thirds of all the disasters in the world are either climatological, hydrological or meteorological. Major share goes to uh, hydrological disasters like flood and meteorological disasters like storms. The second curve shows that the frequency of water related hazards doubled during the latest uh, decades. Next slide, please. So, my second message is when water related disasters are increasing in an alarming way and when the burden of economic damage and non-economic loss is so high, surprisingly, the UN negotiation always avoided water to be included as a priority. Further, when we look into the adaptation fund portfolio, water stands in the sixth after other areas. That means water has never been given the right priority. Next slide, please. And next. Now, if we look into water, energy and food in terms of SDG targets and the current situation, we see that one in every 10% uh, in the world doesn't have access to fresh water resources. Although it is targeted in the SDG that uh, 1 billion people in the world uh, doesn't have access to electricity. Finally, uh, next slide, please. Nearly one in 10 people in the world are exposed to food insecurity, although the SDG targets are uh, targets is to eradicate it by 2030. Next slide again, please. Climate change is going to or expected to exacerbate these issues. For instance, uh, the livelihood and health in Central, North and South Asia, America may suffer decrease in food product production. I apologize for this uh, picture from taken from IPCC's fourth assessment report. It's not that readable, I'm afraid. Europe and Asia may expected, expect livelihood loss and health consequences resulting from water, food and energy related issues. In the right uh, uh, bar chart, I showed that from my PhD research on loss and damage, nearly 5% people living in the coastal region of Bangladesh suffer from food starvation, where three to four days in a week, they leads to irreversible loss of lives and other consequences due to starvation. Next slide, please. Now, if we re start refocusing on the typical water food energy nexus and where we are concerned, when we are concerned about uh, the interactions among them and among these three major issues concerning um, water is a sustainable use and decision uh, about rationalizing the use between surface and groundwater resources. And when surface water resource is the option, then environmental flows in the river is uh, a daunting concern. When we are discussing about food security, food safety is also as important as adequate food and nutrition security. Moving from uh, fossil fuel based energy sources to renewable energy option is no longer a fantasy. Renewable energy options are becoming more affordable and accessible. However, the break even of investment and return at the household level is still a big major concern. Therefore, economics is playing a big role here. Next slide, please. However, there are practical concerns about implementing projects that does not consider environmental issues. Similarly, for example, cultural issues regarding water supply for domestic purpose in Africa 
and poor governance of food adulteration in Asia is critical. Therefore, we learn from by working co-design based solutions in local communities that expanding these areas of the triangle to other cross cutting areas build the foundation of our understanding on nature based solution for disaster management. We used a, a design approach termed as biomimic biomimicking the hexagonal honeycombs to build a disaster resilient school in Bangladesh. Next slide, please. So my final message is mainstreaming ecosystem based approaches or nature based solutions with water energy food nexus is the ideal path to address climate change, loss and damage. This school shown on the right is um, all about biomimicking honeycombs um, to build in a, and it will be built in a uh, offshore island in Bangladesh and I'm now living very close to that. To address the exposure to coastal hazards, the school is made of natural materials which has nearly zero environmental footprint, bamboo. Although uh, built using bamboo, the school can float during a coastal flood, stand against a big earthquake, produce enough food to uh, make a rational balance of food and nutritional security. It generates its own sources of water and energy and finally generates enough income to cover the cost of running their school, including its, its staff cost and maintenance expenditure. The main aim is to create an enabling platform or enabling environment that encourages the younger generation to live with these examples of sustainable living and nature based solution. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nandan. Um, some excellent slides there, lots and lots of information and um, a good, really good sense that uh, of just the complexity that's involved in water and climate change. Um, sorry, not just climate change, but all of the things that you mentioned, water, um, energy, uh, food, etc. All of those things make it far more complicated to manage. Uh, I'm not seeing um, any questions in the chat at the moment, um, so maybe I could uh, ask you a question, Nandan. Um, and that is, when you think about loss and damage, um, the the that kind of impact, that historical impact that you mentioned at the start, uh, and all of the other issues that you've mentioned here, do you get much of a sense that these things are going to be addressed at the COP? Uh, yes, um, loss and damage has been uh, listed as one of the working group areas in the COP since 2011, but the issue is what has never been included and we are not sure whether it will be included this year, but loss and damage has a major um, footprint on uh, areas where water has its cross cutting linkages. So yes, uh, loss and damage will be a uh, important uh, issue th for this COP, especially the uh, concerns related to liability and compensation would be a major, uh, uh, will attract many discussions this year, what we are hoping. Thank you. I have I have a question in the, I do have a question now in the chat, um, which is asking you to explain the floating disaster resilience nature of the project. So the floating school that you mentioned at the end there, um, can you give us a bit more detail about how it's disaster resilient um, and how that how that will work? Thank you. Uh, first is uh, it can stand against, it can float above any, any flood level. That means it will be an amphibious structure that will stay above the ground during dry times but when uh, it will expose to any flood, it will float above, float above that because it's built on a buoyant platform uh, like a boat. So, uh, it can stand against a category eight uh, uh, earthquake in the Richter scale. Bamboo has its fabulous properties regarding flexibility and tensile strength, so that will give uh, it's some upper hand against earthquakes and heavy storms. Another part is uh, when I was saying that economics is, plays a very important role here. The school um, generates enough food through its agriculture system 
uh, that I'm using the term system because it can produce uh, fish, chicken, chicken eggs, and uh, vegetables. That means it will be able to <coughs> provide a uh, healthy meal to the school school students once in a day. At the same time, the earning from this school uh, will be um, uh, will support the salary of the school staffs and maintenance cost. Finally, the school um, will harvest rainwater sources to provide adequate drinking water uh, uh, and as well as uh, water for cooking and washing purposes. And it will use three different types of renewable energy options uh, for generating electricity. All the waste generated from this school will be fed into a biodigester so that it can convert to renewable energies and considered as a fertilizer for the plantation bed. So this is how uh, and uh, the whole school, full school is mostly made of bamboo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, that's excellent. Um, the other question I was going to ask you was just the relationship between what you've been talking about and the sustainable development goals. Um, Caroline's almost already mentioned about the, the difficulty in um, certainly poorer countries in, in affording the adaptation measures that are necessary. Do you get, and, and the, I suppose the difficulty in coordinating all these things at government level, um, do you get much of a sense in Bangladesh that the um, achievement of the sustainable development goals um, in relation to water in particular are, are, are being focused on adequately? Um, and, will that, and does that help your project? Uh, I'll be honest with you, like regarding the achievement of the Millennium Development Goal, which was the previous era of Sustainable Development Goal, the progress of Bangladesh was not that significant. So just I'm we are considering the plan B of self-reliance when uh, achieving the sustainable, if achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals would be challenging, then uh, we are encouraging people to be more self-reliant so that they can live with sustainability options and technologies to uh, manage the impacts of climate change and address climate change loss and damage. So if you look into the design of this school, we are just taking uh, infrastructure investment for uh, for uh, its building. But after that, the school will meet all its cost uh, from its own sources. That exactly what happened uh, in previous cases during the design of flood resilient home. So we when we are talking about sustainability we also talk about uh, uh, building resilience to support their own uh, costs and expenses thank you thank you sorry i just realized that um the the questions were coming into the q a but the, the system wasn't rolling down so i didn't see them coming in um the, that is a question about drinking water and, and livelihoods you mentioned already that there um there will be rainwater harvesting um, but presumably this is a this is a, a temporary situation, um, but floating schools, floating houses, etc. How do how do people maintain livelihoods if um, if if they uh, if they're disrupted? And um, the the water can you can the houses and schools realistically produce sufficient drinking water for those inside? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, for example, when we had, we designed the flood resilient home in Bangladesh, we designed about 17,000 litres of drinking water so that uh, uh, to be collected from rain sources. And that amount we calculated by analysing the historical uh, rainfall pattern. And um, we, we, we took one of the minimum rainfall years to design that. Uh, so we are still hopeful, we are very optimistic that uh, in Bangladesh, when uh, where the average rainfall is uh, three times than Scotland uh, will have plenty of rain, uh, rainfall or precipitation options to uh, support the rain uh, rainwater uh, uh, based harvesting option. Uh, the first question which was related to adequate food supply, uh, food production. Uh, no, the uh, school cannot produce all the foods like it can't grow rice, which is a staple in Bangladesh. But what is going to happen? Uh, from the income from chicken poultry, from the income of a uh, fish system in the aquaponics, it will be able to buy rices. It will be able to uh, uh, provide the salary of school staffs. Uh, we calculated the economic monthly economic return as nearly 3,000 pounds 
from that school, which will be able to uh, support the salary of these school staffs by the supplementary spices, oils, and that we can't produce in the aqu aquaponic system. And uh, during the flood time, it will be the production system will be uninterrupted because it will rise above flood water, the whole structure along with with its aquaponic system and hydroponic system. So it will rise uh, upon water and it will continue uh, the agricultural production. Sp actually, the market demand during the flood time uh, for the produce grown in the school would be much more higher because people can go distant places uh, to buy foods from uh, shops. So at that time, they'll mostly rely on this uh, um, massive community infrastructure. One of the target of these school is it will act as a uh, disaster shelter during emergencies, like during flood or storms and people will be able to uh, get shelter for a few days in the, in the, in this kind of structure so i think uh, that's how that's how we designed all the features in this school so that it can uh, support its own food water energy thank you i just had a follow up question on that if you're if you're relying on water that's harvested during the period when it's raining what do you do when the monsoon stops, but the water levels are still very high? Yes, uh, what we are going to do, we are going to store the water in uh, reservoirs built uh, on the um, just under the deck of the uh, main platform so that um, we can use those uh, for dry days. Uh, in the flood resilient home, as we, as we said, we designed for 17,000 liters of drinking water stored just um, uh, on the burn platform of that school. Great, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Th there's a number of questions that have appeared in the, the chat, which um, I think re relate to both speakers so far. So I'm going to reserve them just now until we come back to the general discussion. But before that, um, if I can just raise a question in your minds that you can bear in mind uh, during um, Andrew's uh, next session as well. And that's really just to think about what kind of commitment you would like to see from the COP um, in relation to water security in particular, given the problems that we've already mentioned about um, cost of adaptation, etc. So if you can bear that in mind, um, I'd like to um, bring Andrew in at the right time now. Uh, Andrew, are your slides all ready? Yes, they are, Andrew. OK, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. OK, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. OK, so I'm, I'm struck by the scale of focus in, in, in Caroline and Nandan's presentations. Um, pretty big scales across much of the Andes and some of the big rivers coming into to Bangladesh. Uh, I'm going to be talking on the basis of some work that we've done in really rather a small uh, river system in the Scottish borders. Uh, it might seem quite parochial, but I'd like to argue that uh, what we've been finding through a number of years of effort uh, actually should be messages that we can take out onto a bigger stage uh, further from home. So I've called this tackling the scourge of flooding insights from working with nature. And, and my opening picture there um, is the Edelston water much expanded on its normal state and uh, somebody in their, their flat at home peering out, wondering what the future holds, both in the short term, am I going to get flooded tonight? Uh, but also perhaps what does the longer term future hold? And the logos on the slide indicating that this is very much a collaborative project that we've been involved with since 2009. <coughs> Excuse me. So setting this work in, in a Scottish context, uh, in Scotland right now, there's something like 284,000 properties at, at risk of flooding, no small number. And ex looking forward to the, the future, uh, by the end of this century, SEPA uh, estimates that 110,000 more properties will be at, at, at risk. So climate change is clearly adding uh, to the scale of the, the, the problem here. And even if that wasn't happening, this is a lot of people uh, who are being affected every every year in terms of their well-being, uh, their health, uh, and sometimes financial dimensions uh, impacting people as well. Traditionally, uh, the, the engineering paradigm was to go for structural solutions to manage these problems. 
So engineers in the service of society would build something to try and keep the flood water out. And so we see examples of uh, structures on the right hand side demonstrating that that approach is still alive and well and still has its important place in the future uh, as, as flood hazards continue to be with us for, for the foreseeable future. But uh, at the same time as, as those <coughs> having an, a continuing role, the question has been asked, shouldn't we be working more with nature rather than against it? Um, and particularly looking at natural approaches to manage rates of runoff in order to try and lessen the problem at those locations where it, it comes up against human interests. So would natural approaches be better in some way? Probably in many places they can be delivered more cheaply financially. Arguably they're more sustainable, uh, though perhaps we should take a moment to think about what we mean by that. But crucially, as speaking as a hydrologist here, um, one of the questions has to be, do they actually work? So what uh, people have in mind for the natural approach and thinking particularly about the Edelston water is that water in the river uh, might be held back on floodplain areas in order to slow down its progress towards uh, people and property at risk of flooding, thereby lessening the, the peak flow when it arrives. If you look at the grass on the right hand photograph there, um, it's quite well grazed, it's quite low, uh, there's, there's not much surplus vegetation above the, the surface there. Compare that uh, with the lush expansion of, of vegetation along the riverbanks here, showing you what happens when fencing is put in place and uh, nature is allowed to, to do what nature does best, biodiversity, uh, and lots of habitat, uh, as well as lots of other benefits, carbon sequestration, potentially uh, attenuation of, of pollution peaks and so forth. Ponds have been created at, at Edelston, and so they're now teeming with life. And as I speak, uh, they're being investigated by one of our international visiting students, uh, looking at the invertebrates and, and, and plant life within these ponds uh, in habitats that have been recreated by human interventions designed to promote nature and hope that nature can help us. Uh, so here, here we have one of the invertebrates in one of these ponds uh, and, and you know, around these river systems. It doesn't take much for nature to begin to do what nature does best. So I said this project is based around the Edelston water. Uh, the star in the top right hand corner indicates on the map where Edelston is, if, you, if you've never heard of it. Edelston has come into its own since uh, Scottish legislation passed by the Scottish Parliament in 2009, uh, where it was recognised that there was an information deficit as to how well natural flood management methods worked, where and when they might work best. Uh, so Scottish Government have been supporting this in order to find out, uh, you know, develop the evidence base to, to help us find out how and when natural methods work at their best and how they can be utilised in ways that would deliver benefits across the country, at not least in the fight against climate change. And so the project has a twin focus, uh, river restoration to try and improve habitats that have been degraded by human activities over past centuries, and then allied in tandem with that flood risk reduction. And it's very much dependent on uh, funding from the, the Scottish Government's Rural Development Programme. It's absolutely dependent on landowner support and it's coordinated by a local intermediary tweed forum working on the ground. So what's been happening at Edelston? It's, it's very much a practical initiative. And so we start that by looking at measures that have been implemented on the ground in order to try and maintain or promote or restore those habitats and at the same time reduce flood peaks. So on the right hand side of the, the photo you see a, a meander and a pond, but the yellow highlight shows where this river was until 2013. It was dead straight um, and had been improved in the language of the day in the interests of efficiency of drainage to promote better habitat and more habitat for growing crops for people. So that's been re-meandered and three and a half kilometres have been similarly treated now. 
32 ponds of varying sizes have been built both online with small watercourses flowing through them and offline, all in the name of trying to slow down the runoff response uh, from the catchment. Barriers like these have been built again to slow down the flow from headwater streams to push the water out onto the, the floodplains and attenuate the peak flows coming from these streams. There's also been a huge tree planting program. So the trees are delivering habitat benefits. Uh, they deliver roughness on catchment surfaces, which will slow down flood flows running over floodplains. Uh, and the trees, as they mature, will also be able to intercept in increasing quantities of rainfall um, and allow that to be evaporated back to the atmosphere, thereby reducing the size of the flood peaks downstream. And we have one transverse strip, so-called, a strip across a, an area of grazing farmland, uh, again, letting nature spring back, uh, lush vegetation re-establishing itself, aided by some trees, again, seeking to promote evapotranspiration uh, and allowing greater roughness, uh, which should allow infiltration of water into the soils. And against all those pictures of allowing nature to do its own thing, here's what's happening when land is used for food production. And so in this case, we've got uh, farmland used for sheep grazing. And you can see that after a period of rainfall and snow fall and then melt, um, water is running over the surface of, of this field straight in the direction of the nearby watercourse, very little standing in its way to, to cause attenuation. So uh, whether we might be enjoying a diet mostly based on, on plants or including animals, uh, all sorts of agricultural activity uh, has been associated with compaction of soils and, and, and there are challenges here to reconcile food production uh, with flooding issues. So I said Ed uh, Edelston is very empirical, uh, so I've shown you what's happened in terms of interventions, but before any of those uh, interventions to slow down the runoff took place, actually the first thing was that the project began with a monitoring network uh, and we've been leading that activity from Dundee since the inception of the project. So the map shows sites where we've been monitoring rainfall inputs and river flow outputs from across the Edelston catchment since 2011 uh, in order to gather data to find out what's actually happening, how this catchment works. Uh, the network has expanded. So from, from that beginning, uh, we've then added rain gauge to improve the uh, rain gauges to improve the density and the reliability of our monitoring. And we've started last year monitoring many more tributaries draining into the Edelston water in order that we can understand how the main flows of water uh, into the top end of the Edelston water and the main stem interact with tributary flows coming in from side streams further down the system. One of the early questions that we identified in the project was, well, we wanted to know how rates of runoff generation compared between different parts of the Edelston catchment shown in the outline in the, the map. And so the red figures indicate a comparable peak runoff rates uh, for the, the median annual flood from these different subcatchments or tributaries where we've been monitoring. Lots of the numbers are in the 0.3 range in cubic meters per second per square kilometer. In other words, many of these tributaries have relatively similar rates of peak flow uh, runoff generation when, when, when wet weather comes along. But two exceptions are in the northwest. Uh, we have the Middleburn catchment there, which seems to produce a rate of runoff twice uh, what was found in most of the other catchments. That's uh, a fairly impermeable catchment with a clay geology uh, and quite a substantial uh, area of commercial forest some of which has been clear felled during the time that we've been monitoring there. It seems to produce the highest rates of runoff. Surprisingly, uh, on the east side of the map, uh, the long coat catchment, our upper gauge there, uh, has the lowest rate of peak flow generated in all of our, our monitored catchments, notwithstanding that it has the highest ground 
uh, the steepest slopes. And, and previously we thought that that's where the, the maximum runoff rates might occur. So some surprises there and perhaps some more surprises here. Um, this is one graph trying to bring together quite a lot of, of information. Some of you might uh, shudder at the number of uh, best fit lines fitted through these data sets. I've resampled the data at various thresholds. Uh, each dot on the map on the graph is uh, illustrating the, the travel time taken for a peak flow at an upper river flow gauge to be translated to a corresponding peak lower down the river. So it's how long did the flood peak take to get from the top of that map to the bottom? And we have a timeline along the X axis. Colours indicate different magnitudes with red being the single biggest event. And actually a lot of those trend lines, depending on the thresholds that you, you choose, seem to suggest that the, the travel times have been reducing as the project has gone on, notwithstanding the introduction of, of natural flood management measures. Or maybe I should say, perhaps because of the, the attenuation taking place. So we have a complex system where in the headwaters, uh, runoff has been substantially held back or, or delayed, but maybe some of these lower tributaries are, are not affected the same way. They don't have the measures. So this is a, a confusing set of results. And so I've attempted to achieve some clarity by looking at hydrological lag. The delay between the centroid of, of rainfall in any one event and the following peak that occurs because of that rainfall. And cutting a lot of work down to one slide, otherwise I might be here for half an hour. This is a summary results <coughs> slide looking at the median of those lag values obtained at each of my gauging stations. So we have catchment scale along the x-axis of the graph. So smallest catchments on the left, blue dots indicate the median lag time uh, between rainfall and ensuing flood peaks. So blue dots for the period before the natural flood management started and then orange dots at the same catchment areas for what happened after we started introducing these natural flood management measures. And the general impression across that graph is that actually the lag times are substantially increased, particularly the left hand side of the, the graph. Loads of data, plenty to look at another, uh, another year or five or ten. Let me skip to my, my concluding slide. So I just wanted to sort of share some of the main messages that we're getting out of this study so far. This has not been a normal natural flood, man natural flood management study because we've had data monitoring in the field for longer than pretty well anybody. And we also have a huge density of monitoring, which lets us see a lot of detail. So that empirical evidence base shows us that we've got uh, lag in our catchments, increasing by two or more hours in catchments up to 25 square kilometers. And that's been a surprise to, to many of our colleagues around the hydrology community who didn't think NFM measures would demonstrate their impacts at such large catchment scales. That's immediately important to people responsible for flood risk management on the ground. More surprising was that our lag values increased as the floods got bigger. That's the complete opposite of what people were expecting. And we wouldn't have those results without this monitoring. The empirical studies also reveal more surprises. As I've talked about the travel times, there's been a, a complete change in flood seasonality with winter taking over. Um, and also we've discovered over the duration of the project so far that snow melt seems to feature among most of the largest events, something that hydrologists normally regard as inconvenient uh, and exclude from their studies. So I think this this study has been really rich in, in evidence and needs to speak to policymakers uh, so that we get the benefit of real world observations and not just model studies. So really, that's it from me. Um, this has been a, a study, as I say, rooted in a small catchment, but we're trying to address an issue that's of global significance. And what we're finding is that by investing in opportunities for nature to do what nature does best, actually, not only are flood peaks being reduced and attenuated, uh, but there are enormous habitat and biodiversity benefits as well. So I better stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, a lot in there, and that's been reflected in the questions in the Q&A. 
a uh, number of questions. I'm going to try and go through them in order very quickly. Um, you've mentioned already about the the kind of the the those kind of first first level benefits that you get from natural flood management. Um, but I wonder if you can say something very quickly just about the the kind of the broader benefits about um, uh, a tenu um, kind of the eco ecological aspects. Uh, carbon sequestration, the broader maybe arguments about um, adaptation more broadly. Could you say something about that very quickly? Yeah, quickly. Um, qu quickly would be I'm not the expert on on many of the ecosystem uh, aspects of the study, but colleagues, particularly led by my, my colleague Professor Chris Spray in the university here, uh, have been looking at uh, ecosystem services. So the the, the benefits coming from allowing nature to, to respond in the way that it has been at Edelston. So, so there have been economic valuations of what's the natural capital value that we can attach to what's been happening there. And there have also been uh, estimates of the financial value of flood risks avoided by introducing these uh, impacts. So if anybody wants to, to either drop me a line, Andrew Black, or just to look online for Edelston Water Project, you'll find most of the material is hosted by Tweed Forum and there's a whole load of reports there. Thank you very much. Um, a number of other questions which I'll come back on to when we talk, when we go into the general discussion. Um, one other question just about the, the, the need for the cooperation of the landowners um, and the availability of the, the kind of the tools to, uh, I suppose, um, carrot, and, carrot and stick. What can you do to encourage landowners to help and, and what other tools are there for um, helping them? Uh, <laughs> so to... I, I, I think Edelston has been very much about carrots and I can't really think of sticks that have been used and, and I, I'd be very keen that it continues that way. Um, I, I think there are two kinds of carrot that I would particularly mention uh, following your analogy. So the first is that the, the, the present uh, Scottish Rural Development Programme, Agri-Environment Policy, uh, which continues in force at the moment, does encourage farmers and landowners to engage in land management activities that have various benefits beyond food production for society, uh, including reducing flood risks and, and including providing habitat or other support for, for biodiversity. So, but it's been crucial that there's been a locally trusted organization that can help them understand these perhaps quite off-putting technical documents that explain how those systems are meant to work and actually tell people how to fill in the forms uh, so that they can get the benefit of doing works which the local intermediary tweet forum will help provide them with guidance about so so there's been a difference between the theory of the agri-environment scheme and then actually being able to do it. And Tweed Forum have really come into their own being able to deliver that. But the other carrot that I would mention is that there's a growing momentum and interest in the community around Edelston about this. Farmers are always interested in what their neighbours, other farmers are doing. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion over 10 or more years now about what can you do where and, and the thing seems to have gained a snowball effect. And so because the meanders have been very high profile, because the Tweed Forum are uh, well regarded in the local community, there's been continuing visibility of the possibilities and then visibility as, as new measures have been put in place of all sorts of different kinds. And so I think that there's been a tipping point where farmers and landowners have, have begun asking themselves, oh, you know, maybe we need to be involved in this and we're not shouldn't we be doing that? And so it seems to have gained a momentum of its own. And I think that's really quite important. Thank you. I should say that the links for the Tweet Forum have been put in the Q&A, so you should be able to see that. Um, if not, look it up on Google. It's um, it's very prominent. Um, just another very quick question, Andrew, before we move on to that more general discussion, and I'm, I'm going to pull back some of the questions that um, have come in already about the other presentations. And that's just about the water quality impacts from, from the natural flood management. Do you see much change in, in water quality um, with that that kind of, um, well, with the, the impact of the, the kind of measures that you're talking about? Um, I know that there's, uh, 
other questions about river temperature and riparian forestry, etc. Um, can you comment on that that kind of quality issue? Yes. So, so, so thinking about water chemistry, I think some of the ponds and wetlands have been really instrumental there. So, some of the work that we've got ongoing at the moment um, is is investigating ponds in particular. Now, I can't give you uh, any figures about um, reductions in particular uh, pollutants in the Edelston water over the the course of the study, uh, and to be Honest, I'm not quite sure whether SEPA have that information or not, but anecdotally, um, the fact that so many ponds have been created over the last 10 years and some of the observations that people have made when going into these ponds about all sorts of different water quality uh, aspects, which are really quite surprising. You know, the, the riparian vegetation around the uh, banks of the ponds uh, full of reeds and rushes and, and, and other vegetation that I'm not really well qualified to name. And um, all of that is, is understood to provide surfaces for fixing of pollutants. The pond bed itself uh, becomes a, a depository for, for some of the, the pollutants. Uh, and I'd be very surprised if, if there weren't water quality benefits downstream. You mentioned temperature. I think what's going to really be significant is once all this riparian planting gets up uh, and the trees begin to reach for the skies properly and uh, attain maturity, then um, it's hoped that shading of the water course will make a meaningful difference uh, in terms of water temperatures. That's Thank you it. very much. Excellent. OK, so I think that um, I'm going to move on to a more general discussion now. I gave you a, a question earlier about what you would expect, what kind of um, commitment would you want to see from the COP in relation to water security in particular. We've seen a bit of how difficult um, that kind of response is likely to be in, in uh, poorer countries, especially where resources are not available and maybe the, the issues are um, so great that they, they really will be tremendously expensive. Um, and also uh, questions of um, scale, I think, have come up across the, the last three presentations. And it's that that's where I wanted to start. Um, the conversation with each of the presenters. Um, Andrew just talked about the, uh, he, I mean, he started his presentation off by talking about the, the difference in scale from looking at the Edelston compared with the Peruvian Andes and, and the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna Delta. Um, what I'm curious about is wh how far do each of the, the, the speakers think that those kind of nature-based solutions are potentially useful and how well do they transfer across scales? Are they really only usable at the kind of local scale that Andrew's talking about or can you think about them um, more broadly uh, at the larger scales? So I don't know where to start. And um, Andrew, given that we've just heard from you, I'm gonna just ask you to comment on that if you don't mind and then I'll move on to Caroline and to um, Nandan after that. Thank you. I mean, I, 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 I... I think a good place to, to start is is, is the, the 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 old phrase about you know from from small acorns come great oaks. So yes, I've I've been talking about uh, a relatively small river basin. It, it doesn't have a large human population in it, but one of the great things about that is that the people who have the opportunity to make changes are close geographically, uh, in, in in terms of their day to day lives close to the, the people who may derive the benefit from those changes. And you know, I, I think the you know, UN Sustainable Development Goals are, are quite keen on empowering local communities. And you know, an, an attraction of something like natural flood management is that it doesn't have to be all done at once. It can be incremental uh, and, and yet every little helps. And so if, if that's, approach is is repeated many times over in, in communities across a river basin, whether it's something like the Tweed, uh, which is where the Edelston water sits. But I'm conscious that in in Britain, we have relatively small rivers on a, a global scale. Um, it might be difficult to demonstrate that the flood risk management uh, benefits do continue 
significantly beyond the 25, 50, maybe 100 square kilometers that I was talking about in my presentation. And yet I think other benefits uh, you know, will continue to be relevant in terms of biodiversity, uh, carbon sequestration and, and, and so forth. So uh, yes, you know, I, I think to, 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 my, to my mind, you know, we, we can't look to natural flood management to, to solve all of our problems. Uh, but I think that you know, one of the, the underlying themes about acting local in the context of a, a, a global context is powerful and, and, and does, you know, bear thinking about again and again. And, and, and you know, for, for us looking at COP26 and all, all the attention on world leaders, it's not all about world leaders, is it? You know, they, they have an important role to play, of course. Um, but what can we all do to, to help? And so sometimes some of us through our professional lives are involved in networks. We have knowledge. Sometimes we're citizens and all of these things add up. Thanks. Uh, Caroline, um, do you have any any comment on that? I know you spoke already about um, uh, some of the things that the, the people in the, the area that you're looking at have, have how they've responded to um, changes in water availability patterns. Um, I suppose the options, uh, if we uh, kind of put them in a binary way, are are impoundments to, to so artificial dams uh, to impound the water, or to have natural other natural ways of um, storage, or maybe um, uh, slowing down the flow overall. Is is that something that you've seen in in uh, Peru? Yeah. So there are two kind of things I can think of. One is a much more hard engineering uh, solution. Um, a lot of the, the floods that we see in the upper catchment that I'm working in in particular are what we call glacial lake outburst floods. So these are really um, high impact dynamic events that take place very quickly. So, you know, the response time, the flashiness of the regime is, is high. Um, so I think for that reason, they've brought in quite a lot of hard engineering. So damming glacial lakes, for example, to make moraines more stable so they're unlikely to burst. And that doubles as well as a reservoir for water that they can then choose uh, to decide how, how much water goes downstream, you know, to keep that level low and to reduce the risk there. Another more natural solution um, is restoration of wetlands. Um, I've looked at that more from a water quality perspective because it can um, make something that's quite acidic. So, for example, one of the streams in the catchment we're looking at is pH 3. Um, but when it runs through one of these wetlands downstream, we measure it directly downstream and by that point it's pH 6. So this is a natural solution that's good for the um, ecology of the area as well, biodiversity, but that clearly has um, at least local impacts on, on water quality and thus water availability to local people. And a lot of those types of schemes, particularly these smaller um, sort of wetland schemes, are done in concert with local people as well, as sort of wardens, if you like, um, of those schemes. The bigger ones are very much more controlled by large national water companies, for example, um, quite often international um, companies that have come in and there are some really historic um, lawsuits at the moment between places like Peru and the companies in Germany um, because they weren't ever um, consulted as to whether this is really what they wanted, these hard engineering solutions. And that obviously has quite significant impacts on things like immediate water availability downstream. So there's actually some really interesting questions that link not just the local in Peru, but the international sort of global perspective. Um, and that kind of comes back to your point earlier, Andrew, about what that means in terms of COP. And I think it, it would be really interesting to see how legislation will change and how much corporate responsibility international uh, companies need to take on the solutions or not uh, that they might be putting in place in their local areas too. Thanks. That, that actually leads on to another question that was um, posted in the, the chat. Just about general awareness. Um, so you mentioned that the the population's not really uh, hasn't necessarily said yes. We're happy to have these hard engineer, hard engineering solutions. But do you get a sense that um, from the people you've been working with that they're aware of the they're obviously aware of the changes, but are they aware of the causes of the changes that they're seeing and the the potential um, potential situations in in 2030, 2040? 
Um, I don't know if I can answer the question so much about future predictions. That's something we're yet to kind of talk to the, the local community about. But in terms of the causes of issues, um, particularly related to water quality, I think there's a general feeling that yes, local people are quite aware of some of the drivers of those things. And the the other project I mentioned at the start, Nuestro Rio, um, that my colleague Sally is, is leading on, I've been amazed at some of the um, responses we've had from local people there. They're really clued up on what's going on. You know, they know exactly what the issues are. They know that it's to do with overfishing or they know it's to do with people washing in rivers where they don't have access to domestic water supply. You know, they understand what the drivers um, of the problems are. Um, but as an example, recently um, a payment for ecosystem service scheme was enacted in part of the, the Rio Santa catchment. And on social media, there was a big kind of backlash of people going, I don't, I don't know what this is. I don't, I don't actually know what it's for. No one's told me like what, what the money is going to be used for. I didn't know that I would have to pay for it. So clearly there's a breakdown in communication, I think, um, on a sort of local government scale as well as to how, how they deal with the solutions. So I think people are really well educated and understand very well because they're local impacts. They, they know what the drivers are. Um, but actually the communication with people on, on how to solve that is, um, it could be better, <laughs> I think. Excellent, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to Nandan now. Um, and Nandan, I hope you can still hear us. I know that it's um, yes, I can. Yeah. late there, so um, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you're still there. Um, we've obviously the, the, what we've been talking about in terms of scale for, for nature-based solutions and um, the the awareness of the uh, reasons for changes um, in water availability and floods, etc., um, are are different across the the different catchments that we've been talking about. But I wonder what the situation is in Bangladesh. You've got a very very extreme situation in terms of the the impacts of flooding. Um, is there much space for for nature based solutions other than um, the kind of thing that you're talking about as a as a response for humans? Um, <clears throat> the the answer is um, not very straightforward because when we built the flood three flood resilient home in Bangladesh, the major learning that came to us is it doesn't it does less matter how cost effective or technologically sound the local communities were involved in the in designing the project because there is a strong power relation uh, play over there. The local government authorities or those who are powerful, they sometimes decide the fate of the communities. So it doesn't matter how well the communities participated or how interested they are to adopt this kind of solutions. And if we talk about economics of um, like what Andrew was uh, referring, in his lecture that um, like when we build a flood resilient home, it was not that expensive. It was 12,000 uh, US dollars. Now this time we uh, designed, a, designed a low cost home, which is only less than $2,000. And for building this school, it's around $30,000 that uh, pounds that we are going to spend. But the issue is whether the communities are familiar with these issues or they want to be familiar or even they are familiar with that local authorities have interests in pursuing this kind of projects so one of the most important uh, learning from uh, the last phase of the project that we are trying to tackle now how to involve not only the communities but also other stakeholders in the project including the government actors and local government actors, so that uh, we can design the solution not only with the communities, but also with the overall uh, participation. Decisions need to be taken at the regional level, at the national level, by influencing the national building code for uh, replicating this kind of solutions. We also need influence in the COPs, where uh, other country parties can implement similar kind of projects and share their experiences. So this is not when we are talking about climate change. Yes, the local uh, peoples are suffering the most and they are mostly exposed, but we have to be mindful that this is a global problem. We have to solve it globally as well as we have to 
uh, jump locally as and when needed. So yeah, that's what I want to share. This is a common problem for uh, sometimes I argue with my colleagues and friends here that flood resilient home probably is not that suitable for, for Scotland or UK. I differ. I, I, I argue with them because this is not about a floating home. This is about living sustainably, relying on your own safe source of water, on your own safe sources of affluent source of renewable energies is uh, what we need now. What Greta uh, last week said in the UN uh, United Nations uh, National Assembly that we have hard enough all this blah 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 we have hard enough now this is the time to do something and that's what we are trying to do now do something so that we can create examples thank you thank you I mean I, I was just reflecting on the fact that Bangladesh is uh, uh, an extremely centralized system and that everything is pulled in towards um, Dhaka. Uh, do you think so that going back to that question about communication that Carolyn raised um, is is the national scale really the one of the only scales that you can address uh, these these major problems at because the the local at the local very local scale it's much more difficult to do anything that's going to be have, have a, 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 a much of an impact. Yeah, I agree with you that uh, doing anything at the local level is important I, and we can't ignore the different localities and geographies and cultural differences in, at the local level. But what I'm trying to say is without the influence from the national level, from the national government and the decentralized government at the regional level and local level, it would be difficult to implement anything. So um, yes. Otherwise, what happens that if we build discrete interventions at the communities, like three flood resilient homes that we built in Shariatpur, that created further marginalization of those communities, of those families. They became very special to the rest of the communities. And finally, they couldn't sustain on those houses because they became marginalized. So we need to create examples at the local level, but without uh, the influence from the national level and without influencing the national building codes or national policies on disaster management, it would be difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to Andrew very quickly and ask him about that question about general awareness of um, uh, climate change issues and whether that's had much um, to what extent has that been a driver of the kind of work that, that has been going on in Edelston? And uh, if not, how much it's, um, it's kind of driving the, the how that system will go forward? Um, I, I know for a fact that when the Edelston Water Project began, climate change was not really a prominent part of the argument. Um, it really started off on the back of implementing Water Framework Directive in Scotland and there, there was a job of work to be done with a large fraction of Scotland's water courses uh, on target to fail to, to meet good ecological status and yet you know, since the project uh, was first talked about climate change has only uh, become more and more prominent as an argument. So I think it, it's it is commonly referred to when uh, dialogue takes place with new landowners, uh, bringing people into the project and involving new measures that that, that are yet to be built. Um, and I, I I would just be speculating if if I tried to sort of speak for the uh, opinions of local people who might benefit from from the measures. Uh, I I think you'd you'd get a, a broad cross spectrum like we we do in the rest of society. Okay, thank you. Um, right, we're, we've got what nine minutes left. Um, I've got a number of questions that I still um, uh, I'm duty bound to ask you. Um, the I, I want. I wanted to ask. It kind of relates to the 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 question about that about scale, and that's the relevance of COP. Um, if uh, if you had a chance to stand up in front of Alex Sharma and Boris Johnson and say, "Well, this is what we need to do," 
A, what would you say? And then B, do you, how do you make it relevant for the people in the, the country that you're representing? Because it's, it strikes me that uh, there's, a, there's always a disconnect between um, where the impact is felt and the point at where decisions are actually made. Um, so I'm going to ask Caroline first. Sorry, that's I'm putting you on the on the spot a bit, Caroline. That's all right. Do you know, I think what I would say, and this is very much related to the the projects that I've been working on, I would say please don't cut overseas development aid any further because you know I think maybe they neglected to think about actually what some of that research is about. Um, projects like ours are ultimately about climate research and in parts of the world like as I said earlier really like critically feel the impacts of climate change so not only are we learning about the impacts but we're working with the people on the ground who feel those impacts and have insight into how best to adapt to them or mitigate them so I think I would ask them to, to please like consider our global position as researchers in the UK you know, because I think ultimately to make a difference globally, we still need to be working with people internationally and learning from the experience in those countries where the where the main impacts or the, the really big impacts are being felt um, probably more so than they are here. You know, we do feel impacts in the UK, of course we do. Um, but I think there's a, a growing disconnect perhaps. Um, so I would, I would really ask them to think again about um, their priorities in terms of uh, funding and, and how important it is that we keep those relationships going. Here, here. Uh, if I can just add to that, I just wondered to what extent you think that the Peruvian, the groups that you're working with in the field, how well do they feel represented in that in that kind of area at maybe local or national governments? Do they feel that they have a voice? Um, no, I don't. I don't think they do. I, Peruvians are fantastic at um, protesting. There's there's protests going on in Peru and, uh, and across a lot of South America all the time. But the reason for that is because I don't think they really are considered at a local or regional scale. And that that was quite clear when the payment for ecosystem service initiative was put in place, and people didn't understand why. No one had communicated that. It's clear the way that they react to international companies that come in with hydropower schemes and irrigation schemes without local consultation. Um, and it's clear in the disconnect between the rural communities and the urban communities as well. Um, for some of the work that our Peruvian collaborators have been doing recently, going out into the field and talking with really remote rural communities, you know, the sorts that you have to access by spending quite a lot, a lot of time on horseback to, to actually to get to them. You know, these were communities that had never really had the opportunity to discuss water resource issues before and were really, really welcoming um, to, to our researchers who went there. So I think, yeah, ultimately the, the people who are feeling it most acutely are, are not um, the ones that are being engaged in conversations locally and nationally, certainly. Excellent. OK, thank you. Um, Nandan, same question for you, I suppose. Um, the what what would you say if you if you were able to stand stand in front of Alex Sharma and um, and and not not hit him? Um, what would you what would you say to him in terms of the things that need to get dealt with at the COP that would be especially relevant for Bangladesh? And uh, if you permit me, I would like to share my views about loss and damage because I am not an expert on other negotiation related issues. Uh, loss and damage negotiation has been has uh, been happening over the last uh, uh, ten years now, and uh, it has a progressive development stages. Uh, it has some progressive development stages in the COP process. So this year, what we are expecting is uh, we have already got an institutional setup that has been um, set up under the Warsaw International Mechanism, but what is not yet established is how to. Uh, find a clear cut solution for channeling the financial and technological support for implementing projects or actions to address loss and damage in the developing countries. Right now the finance is um, for adaptation and there is no dedicated finance for loss and damage and this is quite important, quite an important agenda. Uh, even if we start uh, doing something very uh, small scale. 
Uh, we also like to see some mention about nature based solution, which is going to we which is going to happen because that has already happened in the uh, uh, ministerial meetings. So uh, we are expecting some mention about nature based solution where water as a major component of the uh, uh, nature based solution demands a place. And we are hopeful that the issue of water governance and transboundary water management issues uh, will uh, can expect some um, mentions in the coming years, not this year, but in the coming years. That's um, I. Those are the issues that I want to uh, uh, raise to uh, our COP president Alok Sharma or uh, in the coming uh, COP sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrew, uh, it might I think it, probably for us it seems a bit um, it's a different situation here in terms of um, COP. Uh, I just wondered uh, if you I mean we're in a slightly different position in relation to the government of course as well. Um, but do you think that there are there are things more broadly not just focusing on the 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 the, the Elston for example or nature based solutions? Do you think that there are things that we need to be saying to the, the government from a water perspective on climate change, for example, in relation to um, uh, uh, other renewable energy types, hydro, etc. Are the things that we need to be saying that uh, would would help in terms of our nat naturally determined contributions, etc., that would bring greenhouse gas emissions down? Um, so in, in the energy area, I don't think I would be saying very much, to be honest. Uh, you might expect me to say that hydro solution, uh, hydro power uh, continues to be in, in, important, but actually hydropower is getting overtaken now. The scale of offshore wind that's being developed off, off the UK now is absolutely enormous. And I think it's going to change the context in which we look at freshwater uh, resource management for hydropower and other purposes. One message I would want to get across uh, from the, the story of Edelston Water, I think, is, is to help communities to help themselves. Um, I, th I think a, a country in which uh, everybody always thinks that the answer to all of our solutions has to come from government is doomed. Uh, and and the, the, the sooner and the more that uh, governments can look to their own people and encourage uh, at least promote dialogue, uh, encourage communities to think about um, helping themselves. It, it, it takes stuff off of government balance sheets. We, we can see how perpetually overloaded uh, government balance, balance sheets are, and that was before COVID came along. So, you know, I, I think the, the think, think local, uh, act local, sorry, uh, is, is really important. Um, but on the global side, extending beyond my comments beyond Edelston and, and, and just speaking as, as a citizen again, I, I hope that COP26 has some place for thinking about the, the price of resources, that the, the price paid uh, for consuming resources, because I think here in the West we consume resources so effortlessly, so quickly, so easily, so cheaply, let alone the pollution that then stems from those, which is not recycled in a circular way, you know, we've got to think about the resources we're consuming as a as a as a, a global community. Because uh, we don't. Andrew, I'm, I, I'm going to stop you on that very succinct point because we've come to four o'clock, four o one now, unfortunately. Um, so I have to draw the meeting to a close. Unfortunately, um, I'd like to uh, extend a great uh, thanks to the speakers, to Caroline Clayson, to Nanda Mukherjee, and to Andrew Black. Uh, I hope this has been uh, an interesting and informative session for those of you who've attended. Thank you for your questions um, and uh, I hope to see you at the next event in a week's time. Thank you all.